everyone. Welcome back to Dragonfly Engineering. Well, this week I went ahead and did a thing. I bought this, this 1965 Do-All bandsaw off of eBay. Uh, got a little out of hand and I started shopping and I clicked and I bought it. So, wound up driving down to LA and visited my old college buddy and we went and picked this thing up and was able to pack it into my little ProMaster city van. Yeah, so that whole thousand pound bandsaw fit into the back of this uh, small minivan. <laughs> and miraculously it fit, and the riggers down in LA actually agreed to load it. <laughs> so I got some footage on how we did that down in LA, and then I got some footage of us unloading it here. <laughs> uh, that's one way to do it. And let's take a look at uh, how the saw looks. It does need a little help, so we are probably going to have another episode where we fix up some things with the saw, but let's turn her on and see how what we're starting with. And watching other YouTubers like Keith Rucker on VintageMachinery.org and Steve Summers on his show, they both recently bought do all so I figured I'd follow the trend uh, as a as an upcoming YouTuber and get my own 1960s, or I think this is a 1965 do-all. Hearing from, I think, Keith Rucker, he mentioned that there's a series of do-alls that are the meteorite saws, and as it turns out, this uh, saw guide here does have meteorite as one of the recommended materials to cut uh, under the diamond blade section. So that's cool, I got a meteorite saw, as he says. All right, well, let's turn her on and see what it sounds like. I'm sure it's going to sound nice and smooth coming from 1965 with basically no maintenance since. So let's see what we got. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, I think I've got some contactor hum. You know, the, the contactor switch here for the push start and stop has kind of got that 60 hertz hum to it. And there's uh, the belts are a little loose inside. So as I change the variable speed on this thing, you'll start to hear a squeaking sound, which is a lever on the motor that indicates that probably I need to get new belts. So that, that horrible squeaking sound and the general rumbleness of this machine, you know, means I probably have to do some work on it. But the speed indicator does work, which is basically probably like a, a speedometer from like a, a Volkswagen or something from that vintage. Let's slow it down. So about 100 surface feet per minute, which is the speed we're running at right now, is a good speed. Uh, and uh, this, this saw does have a, a uh, blade welder which kind of works, we'll get into that in a second. And it does have a coolant system with a, uh, with a coolant spout here, and then there's a, a coolant tray down at the bottom. So let me turn this off, and we can go and check out the back of it. All right, you're gonna see shortly the, 
the definite amateur rigging work that I did to unload this saw out of the ProMaster City van and bring it back vertical. And it was a little, a little unprofessional and precarious, but this, this machine built from in, in the 60s is so battleship-like that it didn't seem to care about my uh, amateur rigging skills. <laughs> See how it's. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> All right. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Okay, going up. That's perfectly okay. <laughs> All right. Now that we're at maximum danger, <laughs> I think it's working? Uh, yeah, it doesn't go any higher. No. And I don't want it to like boom either. And I don't want it to like boom either. Oh. <laughs> okay, we're good. Oh. Well, it survived in one piece. <laughs> so we'll pull the back cover off and we'll take a look at some of the things I was talking about. So that squeak that we were hearing when I turned up the RPM, now here's, <laughs> here's remnants of an ancient belt. Uh, this, this was probably the speedometer belt, actually, what's left of it. <laughs> but, so this feature right here is like, kind of like a low, like a brake squeal indicator, but in this case, it's for the for the probably the belts being too loose or, or too stretched. But you can hear that, that squeak sound, and there's basically a, a squeaker plate that goes against another strike plate. And that's indication that, I, I assume it means that I gotta fix the belt. Uh, and who knows what the life of these belts are. So this machine is variable speed, which is, which is kinda cool. And how that works is this double pulley system has like a, a, a notable V shape on on both of these pulley races, and this this center wedge pulley plate uh, kit will move forward and back, and basically changes the gear ratio of these belts. So in a higher speed, this drive belt from the motor would drop deeper into its V as this this V shaped plate moves this direction. And that results in this other belt uh, increasing its diameter. So this diameter decreases, this diameter increases as this plate in the middle moves back and forth. And that allows for the variable speed. So this belt, which is kind of sistered onto the main drive belt for the, for the gearbox, which is behind this, this main uh, pulley here, 
this smaller belt comes over to a speedometer. It also looks like there's a, uh, a flexible drive shaft that comes out of the back of this thing. And it does look like my old Volkswagen thing from 1973, where there's like basically like a spinning bicycle cable that goes up. So I'll have to investigate that more. But the speedometer works, which is really good to see. This is the speed adjustment. And when I was down in LA with my buddy and we, were, we turned this thing on to see how it looks, uh, we discovered that you have to switch from high to low gear, which is done with this rod right here, in the slowest RPM setting, which is not what we're in right now. And what happens as this lever down here uh, moves, is used to move this V uh, plate back and forth to the lowest gear setting, uh, there is a, a push rod that comes up that's spring loaded. And as you gear down the, the saw all the way to the safe gear change position, then this little lever pulls up out of this, this, um, uh, this uh, spanner kind of hole pattern here and allows you to then do a gear change. And we were kind of stuck down there in LA because it was hot and the guy kind of hot wired the, the saw and, and, but I couldn't change the gear. So we finally opened up the back and we saw that there's this little interlock that doesn't allow you to change the gear unless you're geared all the way down. So anyway, that kind of saved the deal. We were, I was just about to walk away from the deal, but then we realized that, oh yeah, this is, this is supposed to do that so okay so this is the bandsaw blade welding station of this saw and the intention is that you buy a big spool of bandsaw blade like here I've got 50 feet of three tooth per inch bandsaw I'm gonna use this to saw up a, a big wooden log that I have so you what you do is you you spool out the uh, length of blade that you need that fits into your saw and then you use this system here to cut the blade off and then you weld your blade ends together here with a, basically a, a blade spot welder. Uh, then you anneal the weld and then you can grind off the excess of your weld with this little grinding wheel which is pretty handy and supposedly it's a lot cheaper to just buy you know, big spools of stock blade and weld your own blades as opposed to buying them pre-welded. So I, I haven't done the math, but I assume that is the case. And we got this, we got this handy blade cutter guillotine right here with a blade guide, which I actually haven't tried yet. So this is the first live attempt at cutting. So let's see how it cuts. Oh yeah, it's definitely cutting sharp, you know, because these bandsaw blades are hardened steel. So yeah, that definitely works out of the box. I did some playing with this saw prior to filming and there are some problems, but let's, let's see how far we can get with, with, with welding these, uh, these two sample coupons of a, of a saw blade together. Actually watching Steve Summers, he showed how to do this as well with his fully functional blade welder. And he, suggested that you actually cut your two ends of your blade, flip them over, and then you got to grind the end with a fresh grind. And when you, by flipping one tooth one way relative to the other, then when you flip it back, then your, your two uh, grind angles will match perfectly. You know, so if you grind it this way, and then you flip over, then you've got a matched angle. Uh, and uh, he says, or he's, he's apparently welds blades all day long in his day job, so I believe him. Anyway, so I did the same thing he did, and now we're going to load our, our test blade into our welder. This is a spot welder, and basically the end of the blade is halfway in the gap, and then we, we clamp it down. You've got to square the blade up to the back guide, and then over here we stick the other half of your blade in so that they're butted up and then we clamp down this side. Now all of this seems to work fine. Okay, we're zoomed in a little bit. Now the first indication that I figured I got trouble is uh, this is your blade width indicator. So the wider the blade is, the more you turn this knob. But I can't, I can't turn this knob. And at first I thought it was like an electrical knob, 
but it's actually a mechanical knob with a cam mechanism on the back to change the tension of a spring and, and I can't move it and also I, I can't seem to see how these two these two clamps move together at all so right now if I apply power I do have power but and I do actually melt the end of the blade uh, together as if I'm spot welding but there's no travel of these two clamps to push the fresh steel and mix and weld the two ends of the blade together. So let's let's try it out as is with uh, by dropping this lever, which will close a circuit which applies a low voltage, high current across this blade, and we should see a red spot appear like that. But no motion. This is all new to me, and we pull out our blade. You can see basically I just blew out the, the spot weld and it's barely in contact. You know, there's nothing holding it together. And that's because these two clamps did not move together uh, to push the, the, the weld beads together to actually make a weld. So that's a problem. So after you've done your spot weld, the next thing you need to do to a proper blade weld is to anneal your weld. So with the blade still clamped in the in the spot welding clamp you then hit the anneal button which I just discovered a few minutes ago is this button here by reading through the paint and you hold this down and, and I can hear the current or the transformer doing something and basically what you do is you apply less heat to your weld to anneal the weld out uh, because you know with, with a spot weld you've quenched the steel in air so it's very hard and brittle so then you go back and you, you heat that weld up a little bit more, you know, like uh, maybe 400 degrees Fahrenheit, and that will anneal out the high stress uh, to create the toughness of your weld. Or, yeah, so that you can actually flex your spot weld. And so you're removing the, or you're tempering the weld by reducing the brittleness, and you hold it down for, I think, just a few seconds, but I'll have to watch uh, Steve Summers or someone else uh, and find out exactly or research it online or if someone can comment how long do you anneal that would be nice too. The other thing I'm I have issues with is our blade grinder so after you've done your spot weld and you push your bead together you get a little puddle of steel there which is too thick. So after you anneal your puddle the next step is to come down and grind off the excess of your spot weld with this with this grinding wheel. Now I've I tried to power it by hitting this button and I do hear like a transformer hum like the motor's trying to do something but physically there's way too much resistance on this on this shaft. So the motor it's you know it's a it's a little tiny AC motor about this big behind the panel. We can pull the panel off in a second. But I'm going to have to fix the replace the bearings or lube up or re, or free up the bearings of this this grinding wheel because it does not turn at all. Uh, I wonder if this is a gauge. I have to see what this little, <laughs> there's like a little tiny slit right here and then there's another slit here. So after you, you, you know, you basically grind off the excess of your weld on your, on your blade weld and then I think this little slit here is like a thickness gauge and then there's some other thing right here. So if, again, if people can say what, what this very thin slit, it looks like just one or two sheets of paper fits into this one. And then I assume this is, you know, the, the, the thickness gauge for a larger blade on the side. But I could be wrong about what this does, too. Uh, yeah, so as much help as people can provide on the comments about the details of operation of welding your blade would be much appreciated. So let's open this up so we can take a peek into what will probably be a separate episode where I free up all of the rusty mechanisms behind this panel. So but at least we can do a a cliffhanger <laughs> and see what it looks like. All right, so I confirmed that the power is off. And we'll see what we have inside. There we go. All right, let me get the camera turned around so we can look better. Okay, so this is what we have in the back. All right. So that mechanical knob, which sets the blade 
width is here and the shaft comes out right here and there's a little eccentric cam structure here which is completely frozen up and then this cam structure operates this this lever right here which is free and is attached to this spring right here and then over on this side this this main drive lever to activate the the weld electricity is this lever so here this is the contactor for weld power so when I flip this switch below you may not be able to see from that angle so when I flip this red weld switch below you'll see right here that that the lever act, it pushes onto this contactor to close the circuit for welding like that and down here the other end of that lever does things with the basically the two clamps to pull them together using this spring right here so this spring sets sets the tension and the small amount of travel to pull the two weld clamps together yeah so you apply power with this end of the lever the back end of the lever releases the hard stop and the spring starts pulling the two the two clamps together which pushes your weld bead together so that lever right there uh, which yeah right right here you can see circuit connected physical stop is released to apply the amount of stress that you dial in with this cam over here onto this spring to push your blades in so this way with wherever this cam is located on this lever this mechanical lever adjusts the tension of the spring and you can adjust for blade width to get the exact amount of travel and pressure to push your spot weld together and mix your steel for like one second or so so that's how it works but it's all kind of frozen up so I need to probably evapor rust a lot of this or WD-40 or various combinations of all of that <laughs> which will be a separate episode there is like a metal cutting blade like a half inch wide blade that came with the saw which is in pretty good shape it has the overspray from where the eBay guy basically just sprayed a new coating of paint on this saw uh, in order to make it look good on the eBay store or the web page so but it's it's actually not that bad a shape in, in all the, the whole machine so we need to do a belt job on it fix up the mechanism behind our blade welder and also I want to look into refurbishing the iconic Dewall blade cutting information disc difficult to read a lot of the red has been worn off but right there it says meteorites which is under the diamond saw section of the blade guide which is cool so the text on this blade indicator graphic here is actually raised aluminum so I think what they wound up doing is they they took this flat disc of aluminum and then they just uh, probably drop forged all of the text into it with like a, an imprint which raised all of the aluminum text up and then they painted the entire disc with uh, like a red paint or a red ink and then they used a whetstone to basically to cut off or grind off the surfaces of all the raised lettering on the aluminum so that uh, all the text was was aluminum colored from whetstoning it and then all the lower level maintains the red ink or paint so I need I'm gonna try to do the same thing I'm gonna see about repainting just the outside ring because the inside ring is actually in good shape because it was protected by the by the 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 black graphic and then I'm gonna see if I can whetstone and relieve or, or open up all of the text again so we'll see what happens with that so I found a little gem inside of this old saw from I believe 1965 we zoom in we can see an ancient oil can down there <laughs> with the triangular pop top uh, oil can opener so let me pull this can out of here 
Yeah, it looks like it's been there probably from the first owner because it's got a nice little can impression on the bottom. <laughs> Let's take a look at it. Okay, so we got a vintage can of Puritan motor oil. Uh, heavy, medium, 20. <laughs> Perocco. Huh. Anyway, so that's neat. It's got the ancient uh, can opener tab, or not, not even tab, just a corner cut. And then the vent hole over here that someone did. Pretty good shape. The, the Pure Oil Company USA. So, that's been sitting in there for quite a while. I'm fairly certain that, that this thing is a coolant pump, which has a drive pulley from the main motor, a General Electric three-phase motor. And here's a flex hose, which goes somewhere. I assume it's a coolant pump. Oh, and I see some label down here as well. I have to see what that labels. Notice. I have to clean this up and see what this, what this label says. <laughs> I don't know if it's from another oil can or part of this machine. I'm going to trace this hose, which is coming out of what looks to be a coolant pump. And I think it ties into this tray right here with that little rubber gasket which is right below where the where the saw would drop its chips and coolant into this this tray here but this hose I don't think connects to the tray so I got to figure it out let's go to the front and see okay so this is that that tray that we were looking at from the back And it seems like, it looks like there's old crusty rusted steel cake in here. So it certainly looks like it would hold coolant. And that flexible rubber hose, I can feel it right here. Where is it going? Okay, well it seems like it's it's probably heading up to the top of the, of the saw. So here's the lower drive wheel with uh, some nice teeth to clear off the chips. And again, to drop into this chip tray. So I'm trying to figure out where this coolant line dumps out of. Oh, this knob sets the, the blade tension by you know moving the top wheel up or down. All right, I feel a rigid pipe here. So this, this nozzle here is the outlet of that coolant pump that's tied to the main drive motor. And there's and this, this flex tube converts to a rigid 3 8 pipe behind this welded steel plate. And that steel pipe goes into the main column, which then must transition to that flexible rubber hose in the back. Let's take a look back there again. Yeah, so this this coolant pump is driven by the motor. This is the output of the coolant pump, but I can't figure out or I need to find where the inlet of this coolant pump is. <laughs> is it this? What's going on with this cap? Oh, you know, this is this may be an air pump. Oh, this is a compressed air pump. <laughs> That's this sure looks like an air intake not a coolant intake. So I think it, I think this just bursts air. Huh. I guess it just blows the dust away from your cut. I guess we can turn it on and see. But this is a pretty funky looking air intake for an air compressor. So this is our our onboard air compressor. That's interesting. Okay, mystery kind of solved. The question is, is it, does this actually push any air anymore? <laughs> I really got to get new belts because that squeaker is going to drive me crazy. I also see this, which is an old collar. 
to something and I'm sure this is important. And I should probably figure out where this, this metal collar came from. Uh, it seems like it needs to be on something. So, yeah. So this, this guy goes onto this, <laughs> this rod right here, it uh, seems like. And yeah, this whole motor basically tensions the belt with the weight of its, of its motor. So this all pivots on this rod. That its twin is here in the front. So that's, this guy's been off for a while because that is fully grimed up inside of that hole. Okay, well, that, that should help with the stability of the, of the, maybe quiet down this, this, uh, <laughs> this saw a bit. What else can we find in here? Oh yeah, it looks a little grimy in there. Well, let me oil it. This saw came out of Los Angeles, and I assume its whole life was in Los Angeles. And Los Angeles has, or had, or still does, a lot of aerospace companies. So it's possible that this saw sat in like an engineering fabrication prototyping aircraft company and didn't really see a lot of heavy use. I don't see extensive use on this thing. Wow, that oil actually looks clear and good. Huh. That's a good sign. It's a little amber color, but uh, doesn't look bad. <laughs> All right, it's coming off. All right, and then with the new oil, this is all I have right now is whey oil, which is maybe similar to gear lube. I guess I gotta hold that. And I'll fill it up to the top of that pipe, I assume is the, uh, the fill line. All right, so this is a General Electric one and a half horsepower, three phase motor. And let's kind of clean off this back here. Hmm. Use this wire to investigate. Oh, that's grease. Okay, and it's still got grease in there. It's like a tan colored grease. But it's definitely got it. Maybe I'll dab it around to re redistribute wherever it needs to go. So I'm around at the front of the saw and I'm going to turn it back on so you can see the the mechanism running in the back. It's pretty unlikely that just changing the oil fixed any of the gross sounds of belt looseness and misalignment but at least we can see if it helped at all. You can, you can see how it runs. All right so I'm going to hit start and this is low gear so there it goes. So now I'm back around the front where the variable street speed drive is. And this shaft is gonna spin, which is gonna move this lever and it's gonna cause the, the diameters of these two belts to swap position and speed up the main drive. So here we go. That's fast. We're going to go slow. And the, the air compressor still works. I can feel the air. In fact, here, here's my microphone. That's good. It says notice. Doing 
we're damaging good. Actually, I'll try some WD-40. For some reason, I think that's better. Oh yeah, kind of fixes the refractive index <laughs> of the grime. It's like a layer of rusted sawdust and grimy oil on top of this. Right here. I may have to hit it with WD-40 just to read it. You guys may be able to read it before I can with the camera. Something, maintenance engineer. That's me. <laughs> okay, I should, I should really read this since I'm an engineer and I'm maintaining this saw. Seems like the WD is probably the best for not dissolving the ink that's in this thing. Operator's instruction manual. Okay. Transmission oil. Date of, yeah, what is it? Sum to, towards, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely something I should know about this saw. Because they say, What do they say up here again? Maintenance engineer. Wait. A can of SAE 20 transmission with supplies. Machine is lubricated at this prom. Oh, they're talking about that can of oil that, can, that was in the machine. Change, transmission oil, date of first operation. Oh, okay, there. Well, fortunately the can was empty. So I think they actually, I think what they're saying is when you first start up this saw, you need to change the oil after maybe 100 hours of use to clean out all the remnant filings and, and metal chips. This side of the notice I think is too far gone the, the ink itself is missing from the paper. But I think it's saying to the maintenance engineer notice, a can of SAE 20 transmission missing, uh, I see oil and then a space supplied with, or with supplies, okay. And then it says, it's all blank to the left, and then machine is lubricated, attached this, machines lubricated, attach this prom, or whatever that can was, date of first operation. And then, sure to read operator's instruction manual, which I did not receive with this saw. Anyway, that's what that says. And I found that inside of the grime in the back of this do all saw. <laughs> all right, so we got some, looks like 3 8 inch cold or hot rolled steel here. This is like an old shipping strap to something. And let's see how she cuts. So we'll turn it back on. And, oh, actually, we're all the way up. We get our little air nozzle blowing off the excess chips. And let's do some cutting. Yeah, it's cutting pretty good. This is the blade that came on the machine, so I don't know how, how good the blade is, but it felt kind of sharp to me. I'm not applying too much pressure either. chips without the air, air blowing on it. Now we blow our 
shift away. <laughs> okay, well that was a pretty good cut. So it works. It's just real noisy. I guess the oil change didn't fix all the noise problems. And then that's the squeaker telling me to change the belt. All right. Well, thanks for watching the introduction of the new Dual vertical bandsaw to the shop. It's definitely going to help out with the new molds that we're going to be making moving forward. A lot more steel molds and probably a little less aluminum molds, depending on the project and the customer. And so for next week, I think we, I still have a lot of footage of building infrastructure out for the molds on the new double shot injection molding machine. I machined some heat isolators out of, out of uh, Garolite, which is kind of like a circuit board material. I modified the alignment rings for mounting the molds. And there should be a little bit more work on temperature controlling the molds. Uh, actually, my brother is going to help out with a system that he's building uh, on the East Coast to help me out so that we can fully temperature control both molds on the, on the dual shot machine. And upcoming this week, there is a, another SpaceX launch, which we hope to go down and record on the spot. Um, not live, but um, you know, we're going we're gonna to basically stand out in the uh, middle of nowhere in a field and watch the Falcon 9 launch from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in Southern California. So stay tuned for that as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye.